Hello and welcome to the World Harp Competition of the Dutch Harp Festival, based here in Utrecht, the Netherlands, but bringing together candidates, jury members, and audience from all around the world. This is the second round of four competition rounds. Normally this round would be held as our regional rounds in New York, Hong Kong, and here in Europe. But of course, because of pandemic restrictions, we're holding this event online. So what you're about to hear is presentations from all the different candidates. The candidates have recorded and produced video previews, giving us a taste of what we could expect from their full program if they're invited to the semifinals at the Dutch Harp Festival this coming May. Adjudicating this round are jury members Tristan Legovic, Miriam Weisenbeek, and Isabel Perrin. Hello, my name is uh, Tristan Legovic. I'm from uh, Brittany, uh, Brittany in France. And uh, well, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be here uh, judging the, the candidates. It's going to be very uh, exciting, I think. And so many um, programs and so many different harp players. So I'm very happy to be, to be there. I'm, I'll, I'll, I wish you uh, all the, the good luck and, uh, and uh, well, let's go for the competition. Hello, my name is Miriam Weisenbeek. Uh, I work as a programmer uh, at the Concertgebouw in the recital hall. Uh, so I manage all the chamber music and smaller ensembles. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be part uh, of the video round of the World Harp competition. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Isabel Perrin and I'm a French harpist and I used to live in Paris and work for the Orchestre Nationale de France for many, many years. But now I'm in Norway and I teach at the Norwegian Music Academy there and uh, I'm so excited to be watching this competition which is absolutely non-heard. I mean no other competition is doing like this and this is so exciting for me and I've seen the list and the programs of those candidates and uh, I can't wait to hear them. So good luck to everyone. You will now see presentations by 19 different candidates representing a diverse range of styles and different musical backgrounds. The total duration will be slightly under three hours, but if you stay to the very end, then you'll get to hear the announcement of the results from the jury. Now, let's get started.
Hello everyone, my name is Nathania Ko, and I am a harpist and coho player based in Vancouver, Canada. My proposed theme for this year's Dutch Harp Festival is East Meets West, Music Unearthed from the Silk Road. It's an extreme honor for me to be able to exhibit this unique harp of mine. This is called the Kong Ho, and it traces back to thousands of years ago along the Silk Road. It is also the sister instrument of the Western pedal harp. The theme not only ties to my multicultural identity as a Canadian-born Chinese, but it also reflects the globalization of music with technological developments. The pandemic was devastating for musicians around the world, but the power of our determination proved that music is capable of threading together the cultures of the world, even if this was done through virtual collaborations. I believe in the universal language of music and wish that the audiences will be enthralled by the transcendence of boundaries in our program. The original intention of the Silk Road was to unite all nations through trade, and this resulted in the gradual emergence of a vast array of culture and traditions in music. I wish to continue on my ancestors' aspirations of internationalizing cultural elements through music. Our ensemble consists of players who tie back to the ancient kingdoms and empires of the Silk Road, ethnically or instrumentally. Later you will be hearing from our composer and cellist Ramsey Sudaka, flautist Vicky Zhang, and tabla player Bailey Oldana. We hope to bring you an immersive experience sparked through the conversation between ancient and modern eras. Thank you. My name is Ramsey Sadaka, and I'm a musician, doctoral candidate at the University of British Columbia, educator, and administrator currently based in Vancouver. Nathania has worked so hard to create an exciting and unique program for your Dutch harp competition. And what makes her program so deserving of recognition are the globalizational and multicultural aspects implied by her theme of East Meets West, music unearthed from the Silk Road. Considering how Nathania and I are both the products of multiculturalism and globalization, her being a Chinese Canadian and me being an Arab American, we, along with the other members of our group, can provide to you an engaging concert experience that is especially relevant to our times. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to Nathania's program as both a composer and a cellist. For this occasion, I have created a special arrangement of my solo Kong Kong piece, Saying Nothing, to include flute and cello. This piece encapsulates the concepts implied by Nathania's theme through my contemporary compositional approach to both her ancient instrument and the poetry of the beloved Chinese poetess Li Qingzhao. Hello everyone, I'm Li Qingzhao, a second year doctoral student at the University of British Columbia. I major in flute performance and I'm delighted to be a part of this project. Nathania and I have collaborated countless times in the past few years, and we both share the same passion for promoting our culture. My hometown in Henan was a significant path along the Silk Road, and many historical artifacts are still preserved until this day. Therefore, this concert's theme is extremely meaningful to me. The lyrical and melodious character of the flute makes it a common instrument in all culture, and with our ensemble, the flute's vivid tempers and colors are fully unleashed. I hope that our group will be able to present a spellbounding conversation between modern and ancient civilizations of the East and West. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Bailey O'Donnell and I am a tabla player, percussionist, and composer currently based just outside of Boston in the United States. This instrument is called the tabla, which is a very popular instrument in the North Indian classical music tradition. And it's part of an ongoing rhythmic tradition that's been around for thousands of years. So when we talk about things like the Silk Road, uh, these rhythms have definitely traveled to other countries and have had an influence on the musics there, and we're very excited to be exploring those ideas. Also, talking about these from a thematic perspective, uh, the themes of cultural collaboration, cultural exchange, learning from, appreciating from, and enjoying the cultures and unique and beautiful differences of others is also a very important theme not only in the past, but also in the present. Thank you. Harp Festival's World Harp Competition. It's called The Circle of Music. It is an invitation to be inspired and to be taken on a journey that has the potential to be one of the most unique musical journeys that listeners have ever been on. The audience, the artist and of course the music are equally important elements. In the form of a tiny concert, the audience goes through different stages of listening to a new piece of music that is going to be played three times. In the video you're about to watch, you will see this concept in action, with the audience not listening in a big concert hall, but in an underground car park.
For my circle of music program, I'm going to play a completely new composition created with my best friend and composer Thais Bernada Power. With the goal that nobody in the audience is familiar with this piece of music and to allow a completely new listening experience. Playing a piece by a living composer opens a whole new world of exploration. It's like unpacking a present, the audience has the chance to exclusively 
hear the information about the piece. And this information cannot be found in, in a book, in a journal or any other source. This new concert format came from my curiosity and my deep desire to ask questions and listen. What does the music do to people? And how does the perception change when central channels are added or taken away? What does a concert space look like where opportunities are offered to many individuals to express themselves, not simply the musician? and where deep listening and feeling can be given voice and shared. The circle of music doesn't aim to offer answers, it aims to explore these questions. So for me it's both an accurate description of my path as a harpist and probably a good life metaphor as well. Like most of us harpists, I grew up learning classical music but I always craved for more space to create and to express myself. So what I'm presenting today are condensed versions of two jazz standards that I arranged using the classical harp repertoire. The order refers to the strong classical background I grew up with as much as the complex rules uh, that exist in jazz harmony. The disorder being my own internal chaos and the way it reflects in my arrangements. I always find some kind of common pattern that makes sense. It can be rhythmically, it can be harmonically, it can be uh, technique de jeu, but there's always a common point. For instance, in this first one, I use the tonic pedal from La Source to go to the tonic pedal of Ungern Dolphin Street. I always build my arrangements the same way. I start with a well-known classical piece that I love. I keep some elements of it uh, to transition to the jazz standard. And for the solo, I improvise, but not only. I also always reuse 
some of the composition gestures or I could some part of the melody of the classical piece I started with. And I love this process of taking a piece that I played for years and reinventing it, twisting it and making it my own. For me it's also a way of grabbing other harpists by the hand to introduce them to my own world. I guess life is a balance between order and disorder. We can try to plan everything. We've seen these past two years that it's not always a possibility. For me, mixing classical music and jazz is the best metaphor possible of how to deal with life in general. It's important to be grounded and have deep roots, but it's essential to know how to improvise with the skills we already have. Homeward Unbound is inspired by COVID-19 pandemic. Drawing inspiration from my thoughts, feelings, emotions, the things that I did throughout the pandemic. It's a musical journey throughout the last two years.
And it is a play on words, the title, because yes, we were stuck at home, but even though we were stuck at home, I actually felt really liberated. The programme is a journey. I started writing music at the very beginning when we went, when it all started at the beginning of lockdown. It was very light, it was positive. And we'd, I didn't know the pandemic was going to go on for the next two years, and it's still ongoing. So it was very positive, the music. It didn't always stay like that. We went into lockdown in autumn, winter. There were times during the pandemic that I felt very isolated, alone, and I did an awful lot of reflecting during this time. And the music, I definitely think, shows this. I think this is also good for the listener because it gives them time and space to reflect as well and come up with their own conclusions. Even though I was stuck at home, I actually haven't felt quite so liberated in such a long time because actually we were, I could get out. We were allowed to go out and exercise, so I took full advantage of this and got out walking every day. I started wild swimming, um, which is so good for the mind, body and soul. Cycling. It's strange, before lockdown, I couldn't, didn't have time to do any of these things. I was working 24-7, seven, seven days a week. So actually getting out and getting into the fresh air and being in nature was really good, especially when you are trying to inspire and teach lots of little people all day. During the middle of the programme, it does draw to a more reflective, darker side, as we have had been going through the pandemic a long time at this point. But I do end the programme on a positive, hopeful side. The music is mainly my own, but I do draw inspiration from other composers as well. Um, I will be sharing some of their music in the programme, um, such as Belgian-British composer Alexandra Hamilton Ayres. She wrote this beautiful piece and I asked her what it was about and she said, being at peace with nature. And I think it really sums up how I've come out feeling from the pandemic.
the, the program is written on my smaller harp, the lever harp, not the pedal harp. Um, I think it's important to, that I'm sharing the music on this instrument because I actually wrote the music on this instrument, not the pedal harp, and it's the instrument of Scotland. I want to show that this instrument is not just a Scottish instrument. Scottish music is not just played on this. You can play, you can do so much more in this instrument. And I want to travel with it. I want to share my music with folk around the world. I want to leave the listener feeling positive and hopeful. It's how I feel as well, and I think it's important to have, to be optimistic. said that father cannot be taught. It's something that you feel. It's a way of being in life. And uh, so it's very interesting because uh, there are no scores of the fado pieces that I chose for this concert. And the recordings that there are uh, depend on the mood of the player. Sometimes changes rhythm, sometimes embellishments, even notes of the melody. So uh, my work was to discover the notes, discover the rhythm, and see what suited best the harp and this creative part captivated me. The Harp Concert celebrates the Spanish and Portuguese music heritage with a program that includes more classical pieces and also some traditional songs of the, written for the Portuguese guitar by the famous guitar player Carlos Paredes and his father Artur Paredes.
fado and Spanish music both have these vivid, evocative, passionate and colorful sounds. There's a boldness, a spunk to this type of music that you can only find here. The difference between them resides on the longing sentiment, the fragility associated with Saudade of the Fado. And when I first heard Carlos Paredes playing, it amazed me his capacity of going from the bold sentiment to the fragile one in a, set, a natural way. He can truly sing with the guitar and I wanted to do that on the harp, at least I tried it. The harp brings to the music a wider range of dynamics and colors that you cannot find on the guitar because the harp has a bigger sound. Carlos Paredes was a virtuoso guitar player in his epoch, like 40, 50 years ago. But nowadays, a lot of young people don't know him. So the ultimate goal of this project is to bring again his music close to the public. Fado is not only a music genre, it's part of a legacy, it's part of a culture. And if we lose that, we lose part of our, our identity as Portuguese people. Hello, I'm Panjo Corbalan, I'm Paraguayan harpist and composer, and I want to share with you a bit of my music. I combine traditional Paraguayan music with some Latin American rhythms and some jazz elements, combining the harp and introducing the harp into a freer musical language.
compositions are inspired by nature, the local landscape, the idiosyncrasy and the native worldview and also the universal. To this music you can listen a lot of instrumentals, improvisations, native rhythms and well I hope you can enjoy it and see you soon. Bye bye.
Shadows of Solitude is an original programme of works which were composed or arranged in lockdowns. All works in the recital are for harp and electronics which shadow it. My name is Cara Dawson. I'm a harpist from England, currently based in Berlin. In 2018, I co-founded a new music ensemble called Red Panel whose genre lies somewhere between contemporary classical and ambient slash drone music. For the past five years or so, I've dedicated significant time to performing new music and I regularly work with composers to develop new works for harp solo and within ensemble. This recital idea started with an arrangement I made in lockdown of John Cage's Postcard from Heaven, which was originally written for 1 to 20 harps in 1982. I wanted to find a way to play an ensemble work in a world in which ensemble playing was strictly limited. My harp is centre stage with three boombox speakers on either side, each loaded with parts that I recorded during a year of solitary music making. In keeping with the Cajun aesthetic, I decided to embrace the environmental sound that came with recording in my home. In lockdown, we were confined to our four walls, yet ambient sound was ever present, especially if you live in a city like me. Each recorded part is therefore a time capsule or relic of various moments in this strange period of intense solitude. Each boombox therefore symbolises past lives and the lo-fi tinny sound quality that these machines produce is warmed by the resonance of the live harp which plays as the seventh member of the ensemble. The next work is Tunnel Music by Christian Drew. The audio track was made from recordings of tunnel-like spaces that were captured by the composer in 2020. It's connection to the way that we started living, you yeah. know, in 2020. It's a harpist alone, surrounded by a wash of sound. It's quite isolated and you're, you're, you're kind of just in your own little world, doing your own thing. And it's the connection to the outside, to the sonic environment that the recordings make is kind of ambiguous and a bit disconcerting at times. This work is Immovable Tree by Eden Lonsdale. This piece features recordings of Aeolian harp that were captured by the composer during his lockdown in Greenwich. There was something about that sound that really captured the moment that we all found ourselves in, this sort of loneliness that we were all experiencing. 
somehow just the idea of an instrument that perpetually plays itself even when no one is listening is just a very alienating image to me that provides a very rich and emotionally complex background against which this composed sound can be experienced. The final work is called Shadowed Arch, Obscure Column by Kieran Timbrell. I wrote it at the beginning of the third lockdown, which was really the hardest just because of the of winter. I think the thing which I find surprising about these now is that, you know, all the individual lines in the music have exactly the same duration all the way through. And I actually think it's because the lockdown, being isolated, you have no concept of time. And maybe that was like me trying to regain control of my time. The sign tones are just shadows. You know, I put it all in flat, so this is resonant as possible. And really, the, the sign tone is just holding it out. It's in a sort of um, just intonation. Um, but, but yeah, it's just sort of this you know, shadow in the background. It's really just like a bed for the, for the half to sit on. This has been a taste of my original program, Shadows of Solitude. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Dear Mr Bowie, it's almost two weeks since the world heard the news. I hope you don't mind, but I thought I might start writing to you. I'm not sure how these letters will get to you, but I guess that doesn't really matter. After the shock of hearing of your passing, my thoughts tend to the length of time you've been alive and the sheer volume of music you'd released during your lifetime. I'm a musician. I struggle to define myself or explain to others what I do or the music I like to play, or even why I keep playing and spending so much time and money on my instrument. But hearing about your death helped me to realise that at the age of 37, there's still plenty of time to figure all this out. I first heard your music in my early teens. I'd borrowed the singles collection on double cassette. I know, remember those, from the library in Stratford-on-Avon. My dad was a big fan of yours. We'd moved house again, and it was the start of the summer holidays in a new place. I loved all the different sounds, the variation between simple and paired back, like the start of rock and roll suicide, to the more elaborate goings on in fame. And my own musical life these days? Well, I've been muddling on for a little while, taking whatever work comes my way and creating some of my own. But I've got a bit lost since my last solo concert and I'm trying to figure out the next move. I get my musical side from my mum and my love of two wheels from my dad. He also helped fill in some gaps in my musical education. I started learning piano when I was five and then I changed school when I was 10 and my new piano teacher um, was also a harpist. Um, I really loved uh, my piano lessons and I begged for my mum and my dad um, for harp lessons and soon I'd found my place as part of a big group of harp friends 
However, another school move came soon after that and music felt much more pressured. Um, it was junior conservatoire, more grade exams, then school exams. Um, it all got a bit much and I gave up the heart when I was 18. I spent 12 years away from the heart. During that time, I started rock climbing and fell off. I started racing motorbikes and fell off those as well. And I started training as an accountant and thankfully I made a bit more of a success of that. The problem was I already had a very hectic day job and a very long commute and it wasn't long before the cracks started to show. The relationship that I was in broke down very dramatically one day. Everything came to a head and the wedding was called off. The next day, somebody else's wedding was very much still on and I had to be there to play the harp for the wedding. Straight after that, I had to get back in the car and get on the road to go and play with a local orchestra. They were playing for Pavan pour in Enfant de France by Ravel. Um, I was in total emotional fog and I just lost all concentration and I missed every single entry in that piece. When I think back to that day now, all I can remember is the total shame of it. How would I let that happen in a professional circumstances? I buried myself in work. I remodelled my house, but nothing was changing. It was a big step into the unknown, but with my teacher's help, um, I auditioned for the bachelor's course in harp performance at the RCS in Glasgow, and I was accepted. Um, in the end, I left my course after just a year, but something had really clicked in Glasgow, and I decided to stay in Scotland. Dear Mr Bowie, a couple of days before my last gig, I had one of the worst bouts of pre-concert nerves I've ever had. Something I read recently suggested that the more difficulty and resistance you felt to something, the more important it was to you. So what compels me to do this? I don't hear many people talking about the difficulty of their relationship with the harp, their music or their art. Then I think maybe I'm alone in this. But then every so often in the small social media circles I've come to love so much, I'll notice something that suggests perhaps I'm not the only one after all. I'm not the only one looking to other instruments and other genres to see what I can use to make my work more my own. I'm not the only one who enjoys telling the stories behind the music as much as the music itself. I'm not the only one looking for a different way. I can do this. I love doing this. I must do this. In November 2020, my gran died. Um, we were very close and because of the pandemic, I hardly saw her in the last six months of her life. For a long time after that awful orchestral experience, um, I really tried to steer clear of any music that made me feel um, any difficult emotions too deeply. But all that time had passed. I'd written all those letters to Mr Bowie and I began to feel better about music. And for me, Time Spinner became a space where I could experience my grief without it becoming totally overwhelming. My Dear Mr Bowie programme will combine some of the music that you've heard um, with some of the letters I wrote to Mr Bowie and some of the stories behind them. There are over a hundred letters, so don't worry, I won't be sharing them all. But there's some good stuff in there. Things like routine, giving up the heart, not giving up the heart, cold water swimming, motorbike racing, finding your identity, love, where to live, Glasgow, mountains, gigs, writing, dogs, morning walks, and even some gardening. I was working with a mentor at the time and she asked me if I thought he would write back and after she'd asked that I started to notice a few coincidences. Sometimes some of his work would appear on Twitter or something would come on the radio when I was really stuck and thinking about him. Maybe I was just more aware of it but I really wanted to believe that he was communicating with me. There were a few messages that I started to take from the letters in that time 
And I think there's something that we could already be hearing. Keep going. You're doing fine. And you're not alone. David Bowie obviously died in 2016, which is a few years ago now. Um, so, how have things changed? Um, I'm feeling good. I really enjoy playing the harp. And I've got a day job that I really love doing. Um, since I moved to Glasgow, I rediscovered um, being in the mountains. Um, I discovered running. And in the last few years, thanks to the joys of social media, um, I found a heart community to be part of again. I guess these days, I know it's not the only thing there is. Um, I know playing the harp is just part of my identity, which um, I use to share the music that I love and to share all the stories that I've picked up along the way. These days, I'm happy to say that um, my name's Catherine and I really love playing my harp. Moments of separation. Fifth of October two thousand and two. We arrive in darkness, long road behind us. Me to weary guest house, you to your hall. Your name above the door, and welcome. We spill your things on the floor, make the place yours. There's a spring in your step. My room is small, and nothing matches. I sleep on a thin pillow. Notes from Shetland's Shanghai is a multidisciplinary programme, combining music and poetry to explore the global topic of immigration. From traditional music to classical and contemporary works written for solo harp, this show incorporates music from all over the globe, including countries such as Scotland, Israel, Canada, Russia, the Netherlands, and of course, China. Drawing from personal accounts, both of those who leave and those who stay, this show explores the emotions and perspectives surrounding immigration. Fear, sorrow, heartbreak, connection, freedom, and most importantly, hope. They have no need of our help. So do not tell me these haggard faces could belong to you or me should life have dealt a different hand. We need to see them for who they really are. Chancers and scroungers, layabouts and loungers, with bombs up their sleeves. Cutthroats and thieves. They are not welcome here. We should make them go back to where they came from. We had a dog called Spot. And everything looked normal except for four locks on the front door, which didn't shut much out. Inside, life was lived at twice the rate. You couldn't deliberate, slow the pace. Small events became great occasions. No detail escaped intense observation. Anger crowded the house. Your numbered arm. Your numb head. And hundreds of dead. The floor screeched. Cupboards groaned. The fridge shrieked. Go back where you came from. In 
inaccurate. There were many things that inspired me to create Notes from Shetland to Shanghai. Firstly, I wanted to create a program that could include some of my favourite works for solo harp, and it just so happened that those works were from all across the world. Secondly, there were particular pieces that made me think about connection and people, and immigration in particular, one being the Flock at Light, the first piece in the programme. In 1969, Shetland fiddler Tom Anderson composed a slow air, the Flock at Light, which was inspired by people migrating from Shetland. Having grown up in the Shetland Islands, I was part of a very small, very close community, but I was also fully aware of the extent to which migration played and continues to play a part on the island. At present, more people of Shetland heritage live in Canada, Australia and New Zealand than in Shetland. It in turn inspired me to consider migration across the globe, an ongoing phenomenon of huge consequence. It has been an incredible journey to put this programme together, to be able to combine some of my favourite pieces by absolutely fantastic composers, including Caroline Lizotte, Katrina Mackay, Sally Beamish, Mikhail Glinka, and traditional tunes from Shetland and China. Putting other people's intimate thoughts and feelings to music I felt such a strong connection with has been a more emotional experience than I could ever have anticipated, and I feel extremely lucky to have the opportunity to share this with you. I hope you enjoyed this small snippet of Notes from Shetland to Shanghai. They are not cutthroats and thieves, with bombs up their sleeves. Layabouts and loungers, chances and scroungers. We need to see them for who they really are. Should life have dealt a different hand, these haggard faces could belong to you or me. So do not tell me they have no need of our help. Should life have dealt a different hand, these haggard faces could belong to you or me. So do not tell me they have no need of our help. Hi, I'm Julia Roxet, harpist, arranger and composer. I am from Norway and I have a bachelor from Trondheim and a master's degree from Code Arts in the Netherlands in Tango Harp. Here my main project was my duo that I have with my brother Andreas on the Ballonion. I'll first just introduce our repertoire and performance and then show you two videos of our music and artistic vision. This performance tells the tragic story of my grandparents. It stands as a tribute to them and all brave souls lost at sea, and as a celebration of those left behind to shoulder the extra burdens even while grieving. With the music we try and make a voyage between sorrow and elation, navigating through tragic loss and grief, to resilience and hope. Finally casting adrift into a deep yearning. 
The whole performance serves the listener as an outlet for those emotions we usually subdue. My brother and I compose or arrange all the music and the arc of the show is created through the use of three different harps which all give different sound, different energy and atmosphere to the show. It is this Scottish harp, the pedal harp and the medieval harp. Now I'll present two videos we have prepared to show you the different techniques and highlight some of our musical influences. First is the music video Sildring. Sildring means running water. This will be followed by a location performance of Havström, which means ocean currents. These videos show our artistic influences and represent our attempts to capture the emotion, both musically and visually, of our grandparents' tragic story. I hope you like them.
that I could have created, even conceived the peace, I am quite certain that the excess of excitement and earth-shattering experience would have driven me out of my mind. Having lived with Bach's Chacon for the past three years, I can only be deeply moved by these words Brahms wrote to Clara Schumann. Learning such a piece was a big endeavour in itself, the difficulty lying not only in the virtuosity, but also the length, the repetitiveness, and the wide range of colours and emotions in the music. The Chacon is the final movement of Bach's second partita for violin, and lasts longer than all four other movements combined. There is only one written rest in the 249th measure, which means that one is continually playing throughout the piece without a break. To help improve my understanding of this music, I decided to learn as much as possible about the piece and to find out how I connected to it. This research enabled me to create a concert program which illustrates a very personal journey with this masterpiece. In the beginning of the 17th century, a new dance took Spain by storm, the Chaconna. It is thought that it originated in the New World colonies of the time. In triple meter, with a stress on the second beat, it was a suggestive dance played to the accompaniment of a motif which was incessantly repeated, whilst singers told stories involving thieves, drunks, and people of ill repute. One of the earliest examples of this type of composition is by Juan Arañez. It was considered immoral by the religious authorities and banned by the Spanish King's Council. However, similarly to the tango later on in history, which was initially regarded as inappropriate for public display, but became a huge fashion in early 20th century Europe, the Chacon was easily integrated into courtly life, possibly because of the orderliness of its repeated bass line. This repeated bass line is one of the main features in Bach's Chacon. It is only four notes long and is repeated 64 times. This repetitiveness creates an almost meditative atmosphere and has an interesting effect. 
Because we know what's coming every four bars, we are intrigued to hear how it will be changed and varied each time. To echo this aspect of the piece, I chose Cora by Michael Blake, who can tell you about his work himself. The Cora, which gives my piece its title, is a plucked string instrument played extensively in West Africa. It combines features of both the lute and harp, making it a hybrid which dates way back to the 14th century. The Cora is built from a large calabash cut in half and covered with cow skin to make a resonator, to which is added a long hardwood neck. The simple four note repeating bass line and harmonic structure comes from the 17th and 18th century Chacon. I was particularly thinking of Bach, though there are hundreds of examples also from the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries including Brahms, Britton, Ligeti, Penderecki and Philip Glass. In addition, the cyclic nature of traditional African music is something that has inspired me for many years. Many historians speculate that Bach wrote the Chacon in response to the death of his first wife. Whether or not this is true, it cannot be denied that this work has a spiritual message. The repetitive bass line is a four-note theme which descends, and is known in Baroque music as the Lament bass line. It inevitably falls every time we hear it, thus imitating a person sobbing. However, Bach's work also includes a major section which seems to lift us from sorrow to hope. I also found this tension between two opposing emotions in Britain's hymn, in which the theme descends while the accompaniment ascends. The melody of the hymn, Immortal Invisible, is from a Welsh ballad. The two pieces cross paths in both having their roots in traditional music, but later being transformed into a work with deep spiritual meaning. The journey the Chacon has taken me on is one of healing through music. There are many times one cannot express suffering in words, but music can, and it can also bring solace. One of the most meaningful musical moments I have experienced was hearing my grandmother playing the piano. She was a piano teacher, but she now has Alzheimer's, and her life has completely changed. One day, Upon being asked whether she loved her husband, she started singing. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly, I've gotta love one man till I die. And she played this on the piano. one of the most powerful pieces of music there is. It has taken me on an incredible musical journey, and I cannot wait to discover where it will take me next.
Michael Smythe was an English composer, suffragette, author, and woman who openly loved other women during the very beginning of the 20th century. The coupling of her gender and musical aesthetics made it difficult for critics to classify her, and she was often judged for compositions that were either too feminine to be taken seriously, or too masculine to be written by someone of her gender. A true individual, she made her mark on history by living authentically despite the norms of her time. There's something to be said about how queer people throughout history have thrived by using their imaginations to live beyond the scope of their reality. It doesn't feel like a stretch to say that queer people have survived by living beyond the norms and traditions of their time, and that each generation of artists and musicians and activists stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. Personally, I feel this tension of identities as I work as a classical musician. I often wonder about how my visibility in this very regimented art form and my queerness are meant to interact with one another. How do I honor both parts of myself as I take on the stage and the world? In essence, what does it mean to be queer in classical music? Thank you. 
being queer and a classical musician, I immediately think about the people and the spaces that define both of these identities for me. When I'm playing with an orchestra, I immediately feel so connected to the part of me that as a child found safety in my expression there. However, as I've moved through these traditional spaces, I found that my interests have developed towards the underrepresented and the experimental and those who are really challenging the foundation that we have created this art form on. The beautiful thing is that I'm not alone in experiencing this duality. There are so many great LGBTQ plus voices out there that are continuing this history of pushing boundaries, and we're all really lucky to be able to witness it as the world becomes a more tolerant place. Although the perception of classical music is that it's stagnant and it's rigid, I found that my experiences prove that it's anything but. My hope is that with this performance, I can continue to explore these ideas and together we can continue to rethink the status quo of classical music. The bigness of smallness. But what does that even mean? Looking up this phrase brings up articles on religion, business, philosophy, space space. Our lives are huge to us, yet perhaps we are small comparatively. We push to win the job, settle down, marry the person, yet don't always appreciate the smallness and personal nature of these actions. This program is not a meditation. It is not intended for that purpose, but if that's what you take away from it, that is okay. In concert, this program is a dialogue between music and audience. The harpist is just a conduit, not the star. It is personal and it is private. I invite you to find the bigness in the small parts of our lives. Well again. Oh, that phrase, but, but was I ever? Life has changed. We've both fallen asleep, but also woken up. Experiences that the Western world hasn't felt for over a century. We've been complacent. Seeing loved ones far away at the drop of a hat or a plane ride was so easy. Now, can we afford to quarantine for two weeks either side. Should I breathe? Can I enjoy the air, the space? Is this healing? Is this how I become well again? Or is this the first time I've ever been well?
This brings me to my final little snapshot into the bigness of smallness. This final work is a really personal one to me because it is one that has brought me so much levity in the last two years. And that is Time Spinner by Esther Swift. This work was also written as a result of tragedy uh, following the loss of one of our own, the late Helen MacLeod. I'm Kirsty Beaton and this is my programme, Between Two Worlds. It is an accurate representation of myself as a musician sitting between the classical and traditional folk music scenes, as well as it is a representation of all of our greater existence on earth and the transition between life and death. I am a classically trained harpist, however, my journey in music began with the Clarsach. The Clarsach is one of Scotland's national instruments and it is a smaller, traditional version of the big classical harp. Despite having moved into different cities across the UK as an adult, the music of the landscape where I'm from continues to inspire me as a musician today. I titled this piece Cune, which translates as Tranquil, when I was longing to be sat on the shore on a beautiful clear day where you're able to look across the water towards the Outer Hebrides of Uist and Harris. Thank you. 
final piece in my programme will be a Gaelic psalm. It will be the tune of Kilmarnock and the words are Psalm 23. I was incredibly fortunate to have a handful of Kilmuir's finest traditional Gaelic psalm singers available to feature as part of my video. Gaelic psalm singing is one of the purest and oldest forms of Gaelic song within Scotland. The singing brings people together during difficult times. For me, I chose to include this in my programme because of an experience through lockdown at the very beginning of the pandemic. I felt comforted to have a community, even during a pandemic, of local Sam singers surrounding us in attendance at a family funeral during the first COVID lockdown in May 2020. It was one of the most harrowing experiences of my life. The sense of community was overwhelmingly strong, even at the most difficult time of our lives. I felt so moved by this experience, it is something which will live with me forever. I've since decided to write a lament for solo pedal harp, which will feature in my programme. It is titled, To Those We Lost, as a dedication and a response to the devastating loss of life during this pandemic. Hello, my name is Tara Viscardi and I'm delighted to be a competitor for the 2022 Dutch Harp Festival World Harp Competition. My programme, Improvise, Past to Present, Across Genres, explores compositions inspired by improvisation from the preludes of the Baroque to the impromptus of the 19th and 20th centuries. These will be paired with my original compositions for traditional Irish harp, which very much have an improvisatory feel. I hope you enjoy this taster of my programme, interspersed with footage of places that inspire the music.
um, which I associate uh, effect pedals and uh, I play in jazz and experimental music groups. With these groups I won the jazz competition Jazz Migration three times and the European competition 12 points. My name is Emily Lesbros, I am a Franco-American singer and composer and I work with the harpist Raphael Rinodo since more than 10 years. We play together in a band called Single Room and during the live performance she plays with effect and she loops everything during the live and all the sounds come from the harp. Rafael Rinodo has an electric harp and she has a really powerful sound with lots of bass and sub and she can play electronic music with all the sounds coming from the harp directly. That is pretty exceptional as an artist to be able to have these massive sounds coming out from the harp. We got the face in 2019, that's the Jazz American Exchange. It's an exchange between French musicians and American musicians. And we got lucky to be able to do lots of touring be between France and America. And that improved a lot the harp system that she was playing. Raphael is the only harpist I know that uses the harp that way. Everything is possible for her. From Afrobeat to punk, classical, contemporary to rock, she takes the most out of her harp. Hey, she would use electronic effects pedals as if she would challenge a noise band as a guitarist. And now, dear jury, let's listen to a piece I'm playing live. As you have understood for the Dutch Harp Festival, I'm going to transform myself into a woman orchestra to perform an electro jazz concert. I would be very, very honored to present my work to you this spring for the competition. Vote for me!
The jury has carefully considered all of the presentations and cast their vote. The ballots have been counted. And now to find out who the semifinalists will be who will play their full programs this coming May at the Dutch Heart Festival, I will now turn the stage over to jury member Isabel Perrin. Hello, my name is Isabel Perrin and it is my great pleasure to announce to you today the name of the six candidates who have made it to the semi-final to the Dutch Harp Festival competition. I have to say it was an amazing honor and pleasure to listen to all those candidates who have sent their programs and videos. The level was extremely high and sometimes it was really difficult to decide who would go further on because we had to only decide on six names. But I just want to congratulate the six of you who have made it through, and I'm, I'm six of you who have made order, alphabetical order of those six candidates. So Eloise Carlian Jones, Juan Corbalan, Cara Dawson, Natania Ko, Julie Roxette, or Maria Sasilva. So congratulations to all you six, and I wish you the best for the next stage. And I wish to all of you the best in your harp life and keep on thinking about wonderful projects like you have been doing so far. And this is with you people that the harp is living the life it is all over the world. So thank you to all you all and I hope to see you soon.